everyone. Thank you so much for being here and for your patience as we're getting it together. I'm so excited to welcome you back for another semester of Story Hour, and I'm thrilled that we have Chris Adrian here. I don't know where he found the time in his busy schedule, but we're lucky to have him. I have just a few announcements, and then I'll hand it over to Vikram. Um, first, we're delighted to have the ASUC bookstore here selling Chris's books, and he's been kind enough to agree to sign after the reading. Um, let's see, what else? Signing, speaking of, we've got our mailing list over here on the front desk. You can sign up there for information about Story Hour and about the library in general. You can also pick up our Story Hour flyer there if you want one to see what the rest of the season looks like. Um, to find further information about Story Hour, you can find us on Facebook. We're Story Hour at UC Berkeley. Find us there, like us, it'll make us feel great about ourselves. We have websites, storyhour.berkeley.edu, and that's where you can find webcasts of many of our past readings. And our sister site, lunchpoems.berkeley.edu, where they have webcasts of their lunchtime poetry series. So I'll turn it over to Vikram now. Thank you. Thanks for coming. It's my pleasure tonight to welcome Chris Adrian. Chris was born in Washington, DC, and grew up in Maryland and Florida. He's had a truly eclectic education and career. After receiving an undergraduate degree from the University of Florida in Gainesville, he got an MFA from the Iowa Writers' Workshop. He followed these degrees with an MD from Eastern Virginia Medical School and completed a residency in pediatrics at the University of California in San Francisco. He then began work on another graduate degree at the Harvard Divinity School, but then interrupted these studies to return to San Francisco, where he's now a UCSF Pediatrics Fellow in Hematology and Oncology. Renaissance guy. <laughs> um, it is, of course, inevitable that readers, including me, attempt to see traces of these varied interests in his work. I first encountered his writing in Gob's Grief, a novel he published in 2001. The novel opens in 1863 with a young boy running away from home to join the Union Army. We learn that he has left an eccentric family behind, including a beloved brother. A few days later, this brother is dead, shot in the head by a Confederate general. The next chapter, which is chapter one of the book, this is a sort of preface, the next chapter opens with these sentences. Walt dreamed his brother's death at Fredericksburg. General Burnside, appearing as an angel at the foot of his bed, announced the tragedy. The army regrets to inform you that your brother, George Washington Whitman, was shot in the head by a lewd fellow from Charleston." End quote. So this man, um, who mourns a dead brother also, is, yes, Walt Whitman, who lives in a nation haunted by ghosts, stunned by the mechanized slaughter of the Civil War. The novel, then, is a meditation on grief and loss, Whitman meets a young doctor named George Washington Woodhull, or Gob. Gob, it turns out, is the brother of the boy we saw getting shot by the Confederate general earlier. He is also the son of Victoria Woodhull, the famous radical spiritualist and crusader for women's right and sexual liberation. Chris deftly mingles these real people with fictional characters and produces a world that slants, an ang that slants at an angle from what we call reality, and yet is completely real and palpable. Whitman, Gob, and Gob's friend Will form a fraternity of those who have lost their brothers. Gob, it is revealed, is building an enormous electrical and occult engine that will bring not only his brother back from the grave, but which will defeat death altogether. The reader is swept into this audacious evocation of the 19th century's bloodshed, its scientific optimism, and death-haunted spiritualism. And Gob's grief becomes a wholly original and profoundly affecting fiction. I think the best description of, of, I've read of it is Walter Kearns, who called it a masterpiece of retrospective mythology. Adrian hasn't just imagined or reenacted this time of national crisis, he's managed to relive it through his characters." End quote. The Children's Hospital, which Chris published in 2006, continues and elaborates on this mythology. One of the characters is Picky Beecher, who in Gob's grief is brought to life by Gob through his engine, out of an aborted fetus. In the children's hospital, Picky is aboard a hospital fortunately built to float. The earth is now covered under seven miles of water, and the inhabitants of this hospital are the only ones alive. Again, the fantastic sweeps through the real, the very mundane and tragic business of a hospital fill filled with sick children, doctors, nurses, and interns is overseen by angels. <laughs> 
the inhabitants of this ark must live and also discover a new way to be alive. Booklist wrote, Adrian dis delivers a devastating transformative work that is certain to burn in the minds of readers long after the final pages end of the end of the world. In 2009, Chris published A Better Angel, a collection of short stories in which the protagonists, many of whom are children, struggle with the messy tragedy of being alive, of being imperfect creatures of biology who long for something more. Publishers Weekly, in its review, observed that, with heartbreaking imagination, Adrian illuminates how people act out their grief on their own bodies and the bodies of others and enter the world of the spirit in this process." End quote. His next novel, The Great Night, a retelling of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream set in Buena Vista Park in San Francisco, will be published in April of this year. And he's actually got an early copy of it right there, and he's told me he's going to read from it. Yay. Um, Chris is the winner of a Guggenheim Fellowship and was featured in the New Yorker's 20 under 40 list of uh, writers to watch last year. Please well, join me in welcoming Chris Aiken. Uh, thank you, Vikram, for that uh, enormously thoughtful introduction. Um, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, so I'm going to read a, a section out of the new novel. Um, and um, it's uh, meant to, to stand pretty well by itself. So I don't think I need to say uh, anything in, in particular um, to introduce it or, or, or get it going. It took them both a long time to understand that the boy was sick, though she would point out that she was the first to notice he was unhappy and had sought to remedy his discontent with sweeter treats and more delightful distractions. She thought it was evidence that she loved him more, how she noticed first that something was wrong and said as much to her husband when they were still trying to outdo each other in love for the child before he became sick enough to demonstrate to them that they both loved him equally and immeasurably. Neither of them had any experience with illness. They had each taken many mortal lovers, but had cast them off before they could become old or infirm. And all their previous changelings had stayed healthy until they were returned to the mortal world. There was no way that you could have known, said Dr. Blork, the junior partner in the two-person team that oversaw the boy's care on their very first visit with him. Every parent feels they ought to have caught it earlier, but really it's the same for everyone, and you couldn't have done any better than you did. In fact, you did great. You did perfect. He was trying to make them feel better to assuage a perceived guilt, but at that point, neither Titania nor her husband really knew what guilt was, not ever having felt it in all their long days. They were in the hospital not far from the park on the hill under which they made their home, in the middle of the night, early for them, since they slept all day under the hill and had taught their boy to do the same, but the doctors, Beetle and Blork, were, were obviously fatigued. The four of them were sitting at a table in a small windowless conference room, the doctors on one side, the parents on the other. The boy was back in his room, drugged with morphine, sleeping peacefully for the first time in days. The doctors were explaining things earnestly and patiently, but Titania was having trouble following along and found herself distracted by the notion that she should be delighted by the newness of this experience. For she and her husband had always been seekers after novelty, and yet already she did not like this at all. A boy should not be sick, she said suddenly to Dr. Blork, cutting him off as he was beginning to describe some of the side effects of the treatment they were proposing. A boy should play, that is his whole purpose. It's hard to see him like this, Dr. Blork said after a glance at his superior, and I'm sorry your beautiful boy is so sick. It's going to be a long haul, and, it may, and he may be sicker before he's better, but we'll get him through it. He started talking again about specifics, the drugs they would use, name, the name seemed rather demonic to her, and the timing of the treatments, which parts could be done at home and which parts must be done in the hospital. This was suddenly very boring. She waved her hand at them, a gesture practiced over centuries, and even though there was no magic in it, Blork was instantly silent. You will do your mortal thing, she said sadly. I know all I need to know. Pardon me, said Dr. Blork. Leukemia, said Oberon, breaking the silence he'd kept all through the meeting. Leukemia, he said again, and it sounded as if he were somehow trying out the idea behind the word. 
He was smiling and crying into his beautiful beard. Can you cure it? Yes, said Dr. Blork, but Dr. Beetle said maybe. She could not remember the quarrel that brought her the boy, a real or perceived dalliance or slight, a transgression on her part or her husband's, who knew? They had been quarreling for as long as they had been in love. She forgot the quarrels as soon as they were resolved, except for a vague sense when they fought about something that they had fought about it before. But the gifts her husband brought her to reconcile, even when she was at fault, she never forgot. The boy was one of those gifts, brought home to the hill, stolen from its crib in the dark of the morning and presented to her by dawn. That is not sufficient to your crime against me, she remembered saying, and remembered as well that she barely paid the child any mind during her restless sleep, except to push it away from her when it rolled too close. Oberon had rubbed poppies on its eyes to quiet its crying, so it was still sleeping soundly when she woke. For a while, she lay on her back, watching the stars come out on the ceiling of her grotto, listening to the little snores. Oberon was snoring more magnificently. She turned on her side to better look at the child and noticed for the first time how comely it was, how round and smooth were its face and shoulders and belly, how soft appearing and lustrous was its hair. It made a troubled face as it slept. She put her hand out to touch it very lightly, right away it sighed and lost the troubled look, but then it gave a little moan. She draped her hand over its shoulder and when it did not quiet, she rolled it closer to her. It stopped moaning only when she held it in her arms and put her nose in its hair and breathed in its scent, poppies and milk and warm earth. Oberon had woken and was looking at her and smiling, propped up on one elbow with a hand against his ear, the other lost under the sheets, but she could hear him scratching himself. Do you like it? He asked. I am indifferent to it, she said, holding the boy closer and squeezing him and putting her face in his neck. This place is so ugly, Titania said. Can anything be done about that? She was talking to the oncology social worker, one of a stream of visiting strangers who came to the room, a woman who had described herself as a person to whom one might address problems or questions that no one else could solve or answer. Non-medical things, she had said, you know, everything else. But you've made the room just lovely, the woman said. Her name was Alice or Alexandra or Antonia. Titania had a hard time keeping track of the mortal names except for Beetle and Blork, but those were distinctive and actually rather fairy-like. Alice gestured expansively around the room and smiled, not seeing what was actually there. She saw paper stars hanging from the ceiling and cards and posters on the wall and a homey bedspread upon the mattress, but fairies had come to carpet the room with grass to pave the walls with stone and set them with jewels and blow a cover of clouds to hide the horrible suspended ceiling. And the bedspread was no ordinary blanket, but the boy's own dear beastie, a flat, headless creature of soft fur that loved him like a dog and tried to follow him out of the room whenever they took him away for some new test or procedure. I don't mean the room, Titania said. I mean everything else. This whole place and the people, of course. Where did you find them? Look at you, for instance. Are you deliberately homely? And that Dr. Blork, hideous. He is beyond help, but you... I could do you up. Alice cocked her head. She did not hear exactly what Titania was saying. Everything was filtered through the same disguising glamour that hid the light in Titania's face, that gave her splendid gown the appearance of a tracksuit, that made the boy appear clothed when they brought him in, when in fact he had been naked. The same spell made it appear that he had a name, though his parents only ever called him boy, never having learned his mortal name because he was the only boy under the hill. The same spell sustained the impression that Titania worked as a hairdresser and Oberon owned an organic orchard and that their names were Trudy and Bob. You need to take care of yourself, Alice said, thinking Titania was complaining about feeling ugly. It might feel a little selfish, but you can, can't take care of him if you don't take care of yourself. Did you know we have a manicurist who comes on Wednesday? You are so sweet, Titania said, even if you are homely. Did you ever wish you had the eyes of a cat? A hat? You can buy one downstairs for when his hair falls out, you mean. That's, where, that's weeks away, you know, but the baseball caps are awfully cute. But listen, not everybody wants to talk about this at first, and not everybody has to. I'm getting ahead of myself. 
of ourselves? Or would you rather be a cat entirely? Yes, I think that would make you lovely. Titania raised her hands and closed her eyes, seeking for words sufficient to the spell she had in mind. They came to her in an image, words printed on a little girl's purse she had glimpsed in the waiting room outside the surgical suites downstairs. She started to speak them, hello, kitty. But Oberon walked in before the first syllable was out. What are you doing to the nurse, he asked her. She's the social worker, and we are only talking. Alice's head was turned to the side, and she was staring at Titania with a mixture of curiosity and devotion. The glamour had slipped as Titania was about to strike, and the woman had seen her true face. Her name is Alice. Stop playing, Oberon said. He's almost finished. Don't you want to be there when he wakes up? The boy was downstairs getting things done to him, a needle in his hip to take the marrow from his bones, and another in his neck to give him an IV that would last through the weeks and months of the treatment. I'll just stay here and wait she said, sitting on the bed and idly petting the beastie when it sidled up to her. He'll be looking for you, Oberon said. You'll be there. He'll ask for you. Tell him I'm waiting here with his beastie. She lifted it into her lap as if to show him the truth of what she was saying, but also to demonstrate that she was settling in. Alice, still standing between them, was looking back and forth, catching glimpses of their majesty as their mounting anger caused them to let it slip and getting drunker and drunker on them. Did I give you your meal tickets yet? Alice asked them. The cafeteria really is not so bad for what it is. You'd rather laze about than comfort him. Do you love him at all? More than you do and more than you'll ever understand. Do you like to see him undone and ailing, but I can't bear to look at him like that. Titania had drugged the child herself many times when he was younger, but now she could not stand to see him in the vulnerable, unnatural sleep the anesthesia brought. Those are very normal feelings, said Alice. I validate those feelings. Haven't I been saying how hard it is to see him like this? She turned to Oberon. Haven't I? Heartless and cowardly, Oberon said, a most unattractive combination. That's normal too, Alice said, the anger, but don't you know it's not her that you're angry at? You stupid sour cock, said Titania, and then they just called each other names back and forth, getting angrier and angrier at each other, while Alice turned back and forth so swiftly it seemed she was spinning. How can I make you understand how totally normal all of this is, Alice cried aloud at last, just before collapsing in a heap. The beastie whose nature was to comfort tried to go to her, but Titania held it back. Now look what you've done, said her husband. At first, he was her own sort of beastie, a creature who followed her around and was pleasant to cuddle with. It didn't take long before he stopped his agitated weeping, before he stopped crying for the mortal parents whom he'd hardly known. And then he smiled for everyone, even for Oberon, who barely noticed him for months. He was delightful, and she was fond of him in ways she was in the way she was always fond of the changelings, and yet she had dresses and shoes of which she was just as fond. She liked to dress him and feed him and took him to bed every night, even when Oberon complained that he did not like to have pets in the bed. He might get lost under the covers and migrate by morning to some remote corner, and she would half wake in the early afternoon, feel around for him, and not sleep again until she had gathered him up. He grew. This was unexpected. She had completely forgotten even this basic fact of human physiology since the last changeling, but quite exciting. He wouldn't fit any more in the footed pajamas in which he'd been stolen, and then she kept him naked. Many evenings she would stare at him, hoping to see him get bigger. She liked to feed him, initially just milk and dew and a little honey on her finger, but then she woke one morning to find him attached to her breast, and she wondered why she hadn't fed any of the other changelings this way. It was easy enough to make food come out of her nipple, not quite ordinary milk at first, but then less usual substances weak wine and chocolate and peanut butter and yogurt. It wasn't long before Oberon regretted his gift and started to hide the child somewhere on the hill, attended by fairy so he could have his wife to himself. She tolerated that for weeks, but within a few months she couldn't stand to be apart from the boy, though she couldn't really say why. Perhaps it was because he smiled at everything she said and never argued with her. For months and months, he never even said a word, but only babbled. It was different from talking to her husband, who could turn any conversation into an argument, 
or from talking to the members of her court, who always seemed to be listening for ways to curry her favor. The trial grew and changed and became ever more delightful to her, and she imagined that they would go on forever like that, that, she would, that he would always be her favorite thing. It would have been perfect, and maybe it would have been better if he stayed her favorite thing, a toy and not a son, because now he would just be a broken toy. She ought to have the foresight to have made him dumb, or Oberon ought to have, since the boy, since the boy was his terrible gift to her. But one evening, the boy ran back to her and climbed up upon her throne and giggled at the dancing fairy bodies leaping and jumping all around them and put his face to her breast and sighed a word at her. Molly, or Mooney, or Middlebury. She still didn't know what it was exactly, but it was close enough to mommy to ruin everything. They poisoned the boy exquisitely. Beetle and Blork had reviewed it all with them, the names and the actions and the toxicities of the variety of agents they were going to use to cure him, but of that whole long conversation, only a single phrase of Blork's had really stuck. We'll poison him well again, he'd said, rather too cheerily, and he had explained that the chemotherapy was harder on the cancer than on the healthy boy parts, but that it was still hard. And that for the next many months, he would act like a boy who had been poisoned. Sometimes we'll poison him a little, he said, while Beetle frowned more and more vigorously at him, and sometimes we'll poison him a lot. And indeed, in that first week, it seemed to Titania that they were poisoning him as vigorously and as enthusiastically as anyone ever poisoned anybody, for or against their own good. The chemotherapy came in colors, straw yellow and red, and a red somewhere between the flesh of a watermelon and a cherry, but did not fume or smoke the way that some of her own most dramatic poisons did. She was, there was nothing in them she could comprehend, though she peered at the bags and sniffed at the tubes, since there was no magic in them. She was only reluctantly interested in the particulars of the medications, but Oberon wanted to know all about them and talked incessantly about what he learned, parodying what Beetle and Bork said, or reading aloud from the packets of information that the nurses gave them. He proclaimed that he would taste the red liquid himself to share the experience with the boy, but in the end he made a much lesser fairy do it, a little brownie named Doorknob, who smacked his lips and proclaimed that it tasted rusty in the same way that blood smelled rusty, and went on to say he thought he liked the taste of it and was about to sample it again when he went suddenly mad, tearing at his hair and clawing at his face and telling everyone his bowels had become wild voles and perhaps they had since there was an obvious churning in his hairy little belly. Oberon knocked him over the head with his fist which, with, which brought him sleep, if not peace. And though he had previously been one of the meekest spirits on the hill, every day after that he was angry and abrasive and more than anything, he, more than anything else, he liked to pick a fight. The boy had a very different response. Right away, the poison settled him down in a way that even the morphine had not. That put him to sleep, but in between doses, he would wake and cry again, saying that a gator had his leg or a bear was hugging him to death or a snake had wound itself around the long part of his arm and was crushing it. Within a few days, the poisons had made him peaceful again. Titania could not conceive of the way they were made except as distillations of sadness and heartbreak and despair, since that was how she made her own poisons, shaking drops of terror out of a wren captured in her fist or sucking with a silver straw at the tears of a dog. Oberon had voiced a fear that the boy was sick for human things, that the cancer in his blood was only a symptom of a greater ill, that he was homesick unto death. So she imagined they were putting into him a sort of liquid mortal sad sadness, a corrective against a dangerous abundance of fairy joy. Then he seemed to thrive on it. If she hadn't been so distracted by relief, it might have saddened her or brought to mind how different in kind he was from her that a, deco that a decoction of grief should restore him. His whole body seemed to suck it up bag after bag and then his fever broke and the spots on his skin began to fade like ordinary bruises, and the pain in his bones went away. She watched him for hours, finally restored to untroubled sleep, and when he woke, he said, I want a cheese sandwich. And the, little, and the dozen little fairies hidden around the room gave a cheer. You heard him, she said, and ordered them with a sweep of her arm out the door and the windows. <laughs> 
The laziest went only to the hospital cafeteria, but the more industrious ventured out to the fancy cheese shops of Coal Valley and the Castro and even the marina and returned with loaves under their arms and wheels and blocks of stolen cheeses balanced on their heads and stuffed down their pants. Manchigo and Niza and Tom Vaudois proclaiming the names onto the boy as if they were announcing the names of visiting kings and queens. The room filled rapidly with cheese and then with sandwiches as the bread was as the bread and cheese were cut and assembled. The boy chose something from the cafeteria, a plastic looking cheese on toast. Oberon, half, Oberon asleep on the narrow couch between beneath the window, was awakened by the variety of odors and started to thank the fairies for his breakfast until a pixie named Radish pointed out, pointed and said in her high thin voice, he mounches, he mounches. Oberon began to cry, of course, he was always crying these days. And it seemed rather showy to Titania, who thought she suffered more deeply in her silence than he did in his sobs. He gathered the boy in his arms and the boy said, Papa, you are getting my sandwich wet which caused some tittering among the fairies, some of whom were crying too now or laughing or kissing one another with mouths full of rare cheese. Titania sat down on the bed and put a hand on the boy and another on her husband and forgave Oberon his showy tears and the boy the scare he'd given her. Just then, Dr. Bork entered the room, giving the barest hint of a knock on the door before he barged in. The fairies vanished before his eye could even register them, but the cheeses stayed behind, stacked in sandwiches on the dresser and the windowsill, wedged in the light fixtures and stuck to the bulletin board with pins, piled in the sink and scattered on the floor. He stared all around the room and then at the three of them, looking so pale and panicked that Titania had to wonder if he was afraid of cheese. <laughs> he was hungry, Titania said. Though the glamour would obviate any need for an excuse, he's hungry, he's eating. You have poisoned him masterfully, said Oberon, and Titania asked if they could go home now. He was never a very useful changeling. Previously, Oberon had trained them as pages or attendants for her, and they learned, even as young children, to brush her hair just the way she liked. Or they were instructed to sing to her or dance a mask or wrestle young wolves in a ring for the entertainment of the host. But the boy only hit her when she presented him with a brush, and instead she found him brushing, she found herself brushing his hair. And she sang for him, ancient dirges at first and eldritch hymns to the moon, but he didn't like those, and Oberon suggested that she learn some music more familiar to him. So she sent Doorknob into the hate to fetch a human musician, but he brought back to her an album instead, because it had a beautiful woman on it, a lovely human mama, she looked at the woman on the cover of Carly Simon's Greatest Hits, golden-skinned and honey-haired with a fetching gap in her smile, and put on her aspect, and spun the record on her finger while Radish sat upon it, the stinger in her bottom, protruding to scratch in the grooves, and Titania leaned close to listen to the songs. Then she sang to the boy about his own vanity and felt a peaceful pleasure. Oberon said she was spoiling him, that she had ruined him, and he had no hope of ever becoming a functional changeling. And in a fit of enthusiastic discipline, he scolded the boy, ordering him to pick up some toys he had left scattered in the hall and threatened to feed him to a bear if he did not. Weepingly, the boy complied, but he had gathered up only a few blocks before he came to a little blue bucket on the floor. I'm a puppy, he said, and bent down to take the handle in his mouth. Then he began to prance around the hall with his head high, the bucket, the bucket slapping against his chin and his chest. That's not what you're supposed to be doing at all, said Oberon. But by the time Titania entered the room, warned by Radish that Oberon was about to beat the changeling, Oberon had joined him in the game with a toy shovel in his mouth. Titania laughed, and it seemed to her in that moment that she had two hearts in her, each pouring out an equivalent feeling toward the prancing figures, and she thought, my men. They were not allowed to go home. It was hardly time for that, Dr. Beetle told them. The boy was barely better at all. This is going to be a three-year journey, and they were not even a week into it. They were going to have to learn patience if they were going to get through this. They were going to have to learn to take things one day at a time. I like to take the long view of things, Titania said in response, which had been true as a rule all through, all through her long, long life. But lately her long view had contracted 
and yet it was no comfort to take things, as Dr. Beadle suggested, as they came. Even without looking ahead into the uncertain future, there was always something to worry about. Oberon suggested she look to the boy and model her behavior after his, which was what he was doing, to which she replied that a child in crisis needed parents, not playmates. To which he said that that wasn't what he meant at all, and they proceeded to quarrel about, quarrel about it very softly since the boy was sleeping. Still, she gave it a try, proceeding with the boy on one of his daily migrations through the ward. Ever since he had been feeling better, he went for multiple daily promenades, sometimes walking and sometimes in a little red buggy that he drove by making skibbling motions against the ground. He had to wear a mask, and his IV pole usually accompanied him, but these seemed not to bother him at all. So Titania tried not to let them bother her either. Though she was pushing the pole and had to stoop now and then to adjust his mask when it slid over, her, over his chin. The ward was almost the ugliest place she had ever seen, and certainly the ugliest place she had ever lived. Someone had tried some time ago to make it pretty, so there were big photographs in the hall of children at various sorts of play, and some of these were diverting, she supposed. But the pictures were few. In other places on the wall, someone had thought to put up bas-relief cartoon faces about the size of a child's face, but the faces looked deformed to her eye, goblin faces, and they seemed uniformly to be in pain. The boy was not allowed to wander beyond the filtered confines of the ward, so they went around and around, passing the posse of doctors on their rounds and the nurses at their stations and the other parents and children making their own circumnavigations. The boy called out hello and beeped his horn at everyone they met. They called back hello Brad or hello Brian or hello Billy since he answered to all those names. Everyone heard something different when they asked his name and Titania replied, his name is Boy. She walked step by step, not thinking of anything but the ugliness of the hall or the homeliness of Dr. Blork or the coarseness of Dr. Beetle's hair or the redness of the buggy. There is no past and no future, she told herself. We have been here forever and we will be here forever. These thoughts were not exactly a comfort. She considered the other parents staring at them as, he, as she passed, remembering to smile at them only when they smiled at her. It seemed a marvel to her that any mortal should suffer for lack of love, and yet she had never known a mortal who didn't feel unloved. There was enough love just in this ugly hallway, she thought, that no one should ever feel the lack of it again. She peered at the parents, imagining their hearts like machines, manufacturing surfeit upon surfeit of love for their children, and then wondered how something could be so awesome and utterly powerless. A feeling like that ought to be able to move mountains, she thought, and then she wondered how she had ever come to such a sad place in her thoughts when she meant, in, meant to live entirely in the blank present. They went back to the room where Oberon was playing a video game with a brownie perched on his head. I hate this place, she told him. They always called the good news, good news, but for the bad news, they always found another name. Dr. Bork would say they had taken a little detour on the way to recovery or had encountered a minor disappointment. Occasionally, when things really took a turn for the worse, he'd admit that something was, if not bad news, not very good news. It was an unusual experience to wait anxiously every morning for the day's news and to read it in the slips of paper they gave her that detailed the results of the previous day's, previous day's tests and in the faces of the people who brought the news, in the pitch of their voices and in the absences they embraced, the words they did not use and the things they did not say. Oberon said that Oberon said the way the good news followed bad news, which followed good news on the tale of bad news, made him feel as if he were sailing in a ship on dangerous swells or riding an angry pony. Titania was the only one among them ever to have ridden on a roller coaster, but she didn't offer up the experience as an analogy because it seemed insufficient to describe a process that to her felt less like, violent, like a violent, unpredictable ride and more like someone ripping your heart out one day and then stuffing it back in your chest on the next. There was very little about it that she found unpredictable, and it was as much a comfort to know that the bad news would be followed by good as it was a slumping misery to know that the good news was never final. She was starting to believe that, more than anything, they had only lucky days and unlucky, that some cruel arbiter, mightier than either she or her husband, was presiding over this illness, and she wasn't always convinced when Beetle or Blork told them that something was working, that something they did was making the boy better. His leukemia went away, 
which was good news, but not very quickly, which was bad news. His white blood cells would not grow back, which was bad news, and yet would have been even worse news if he had had too many of them. He had no fever, which was good news, until he got one, and that was very bad. The Blork seemed to intimate in his stuttering way that there were worse things that might happen. It meant they could not go home, though Beetle and Blork were always promising that a trip home was just around the corner. On the third week, the fever went away and the white blood cells began to come back, but then Dr. Bork came to them with a droopy slip of paper documenting that the white blood cells were the evil cancerous sort, and Titania could tell that there was not much worse he could think of to be telling them. They shuffled the boy's poisons and brought him shots of thick white liquid that they shoved into his thighs. Those shots made him scream like nothing else had, and she could not bear to be in the room when it happened because she could not bear the look the boy gave her, which asked so clearly, shouldn't you kill them for hurting me like this? The new poison turned him, around, turned him around again. The evil cells began to retire from his blood and his bones, but then his innards became irritated. And they decided, though he was always ravenous, that he couldn't eat. It's a crime, Oberon said. Damn the triglycerides. The boy is hungry. The nurses had hung up a bag, a bag of food for him, honey-colored liquid that went directly into his veins. Oberon slapped at the bag and said it didn't look very satisfying. He fed the boy a bun and a steak and a crumpled cream puff, pulling each piece of food from his pocket with a flourish. Titania protested and threatened to go get the nurse and even held the call button in her hand, almost pressing it while Oberon laughed and the boy shoved steak in his face. He threw it all up in an hour, the steak looking practically unchanged when it came back up and became listless and squash colored for three days. When they were asked, if the boy had eaten anything, Oberon only shrugged. But as soon as he had recovered, he was crying again for food, pleading with them all the time, no matter how the nurses fiddled with the bag that was supposed to keep him sated. One morning, the whole team showed up, Beetle and Blork, and the junior, junior doctors whose names Titania could never remember, and Alice and the nurse, and another two or three mortals whose function, if it was something besides just skulking about, she never did discover. When Dr. Bork asked him how he was doing, he pleaded with them too. Can I have just one tiny little feast, he asked, and they laughed at him. They chucked his chin and tousled the place where his hair had been, and they went out, leaving her with this dissatisfied, suffering creature. Mama, please, he said, all day. Just one little feast. I won't ask again, I promise. Oberon was silent and left the room, eventually once again crying his useless tears, and Titania told the boy he would only become sick if he ate, that even one feast might mean another week before he could eat again. Don't think of eating, she said. Think of this bird instead. And she pulled a parrot out from within, within the folds of her robe, but the boy only asked if he could eat it. He wore her down toward evening. Oberon had still not returned, and when she sent Radish to fetch him, she said only, he's still weeping, see? and she held up a thimble, brimming with his tears. Titania sighed, wanting to run from the boy and his, and his anxious, unhappy hunger, which had seemed to her as the day dragged on to represent, and then to become, a hunger for something else besides food. He didn't want food, he wanted to be well. To run on the hill under the starlight, to ride on the paths in the park in a little cart pulled by six raccoons. He wanted to spend a day not immersed in hope and hopelessness. She could not give him any of that right now. All right, my love, she said, just one bite. And she brought out a chocolate from her bag, but before she could give it to him, Oberon returned, calling for her to stop because he had something better. He cleared a space on the bed and put down a little sack, and very de delicately, pinching with his thumb and his forefinger, removed all the ingredients for a tiny feast and laid them on the bed. It will be faster if you help, he told her as he squinted to chop up a moat-sized carrot. So she picked up the bag, so she picked up a bag the size of her thumb, emptied out the beans from them, and began to snap. The boy kept trying to eat things raw at first, but Oberon slapped his hand away and told him to be patient, and eventually he helped as well, twisting the heads off the little chickens when Oberon handed them to him and laughing when they danced a few seconds in his palm. It took a long time to prepare the feast, though they had more and more help, as more fairies popped up in the room, some of whom were sized better for the work. 
Still more of them gathered around in an audience stuck to the walls, crowding the shelves, perched on the lintel, all of them muttering opinions as the preparation went on, that they would have baked the fish, not seared it, and salted the cabbage, but not the asparagus, and chosen caramel over fudge for the cake. When it was done, the boy ate the whole thing and did not share a morsel, which was exactly as it was supposed to be. Aside from the size of it, there was nothing magical about the food. It shouldn't have sated him any more than a half a dozen peanuts, but even the aroma calmed him down as they were cooking. And by the time he had finished off the last tack-sized pastry and dime-sized cake, he was very quiet again. He looked around the bed and around the room as if for more food, so when he opened his mouth wide, Titania thought he was going to shout or cry, but he burped instead, a tiny little noise, commensurate with what he had just eaten. She had lost him once, just for a little while. He liked to hide, but didn't do it very well, too giggly ever to make his location a secret. But she woke one morning to find him gone from his customary place underneath her arm, and she couldn't find him in the usual places, in a lump, of a, of a, in a lump under the covers at the foot of the bed, or on the floor next to the bed, or even under the bed. Is this a game? She asked her husband, shaking him awake, and she demanded, where have you hidden the boy? He had not hidden him anywhere, and no fairy had made off with him or used his parts in a spell or put him in a pie to eat. But all through the early part of the evening, he was nowhere to be found, though she commanded the whole host to search for him under the hill. She began to suspect that his mortal mother had stolen him back and not even done her the courtesy of returning the little hobgoblin that had been left in his place. Oberon could not convince her of how, of how extremely unlikely this would be, so she strapped on her armor, grieve by grieve. For a while, Oberon was able to get it off her as fast as she could put it on, nuzzling and speaking ever so soothingly about how the boy would be found, but eventually she outstripped him. She placed her helmet on her head and called the host to war, and all the peace-loving fairies of Buena Vista Park reluctantly put on their silver mail and took up their ruby-tipped spears and made ready to stream out into the mission to slay the woman who had stole, stolen their mistress's child. But Doorknob found him before they could march out of the woods. He was under a cupboard, sound asleep, and, only, and, one only, and one had only to sniff at him to understand that he had wandered thirsty from bed to the kitchen, drunk at length from the wine bowl instead of the water bowl, and perhaps had a solitary toddling drunken party all his own before hiding himself away to sleep. Titania wanted to kiss him and hold him, of course, but it occurred to her that there were other things she could do to him right then. Shrink him down enough to carry him around in her mouth or make him a hump on her back or chain him to her foot to foot. He woke as she was considering these things and blinked at her and then at the fairies all, all around him, attired for war, and turned on his side and went back to sleep. What a terrible gift you've given me, she said to her husband. They were sitting at the boy's bedside, not holding hands, but their knees were touching. There had been bad news and then worse news and then the worst news yet. The bad cells were back in his blood and he had a fever and there was an infection in the bones of his face. Dr. Blork said a fungus was growing there and had admitted that this, was, this news was in fact bad. And he had looked both, both awkward and grave as he sat with them, twisting his stethoscope around in his hands and apologizing for the turn of events, though not exactly accepting responsibility for the failures of the treatment. Oberon had said that mushrooms were some of the friendliest creatures he knew and he could not understand how they could possibly represent a threat to anyone. But Dr. Bork shook his head and said that the fungus, that this fungus was nobody's friend, and further explained that the presence of the new infection compromised the doctor's ability to poison him anymore, and that for this reason the, the, the leukemia cells were having a sort of holiday. The boy was sleeping. They had brought back the morphine for his pain, so he was rarely awake and not very happy when he was. Titania moved from her chair to the bed and took his hand. Even asleep, he pulled it away. A terrible gift, she said. Don't say such things, Oberon said. Terrible, she said. Terrible, terrible. She sat on the bed, taking the boy's hand over and over again as he pulled it away, and told her husband she was afraid that when the boy died, he would take away with him not just all the love she felt for him, but all the love she felt for Oberon, too and all the love she had felt for anything or anyone in the world. He would draw it after him as if by decree of some natural law that magic could not violate, and then she would be left with nothing 
Do not speak of such things, my love, her husband said, and he kissed her. She let him do that, and she let him put his hands inside her dress and let him draw, draw her over to the narrow little couch where they were supposed to sleep at night. She tried to pretend that this was any other night under the hill when they would roll and wrestle with each other while the boy slept next to them, oblivious. They were walked in upon a number of times, but everyone who, everyone who walked in saw something different, and no one remembered what they had seen after they turned and fled the room. The night nurse coming in to change some IV fluid saw two blankets striking and grappling with each other on the couch. A nursing assistant saw a mass of snakes and cats twining over one another, sighing and hissing. Dr. Beetle actually managed to perceive Oberon's mighty thrusting bottom and went stumbling back out into the hall, temporarily blinded. One evening, Dr. Beetle came in alone, lurkless, and sat down on the bed where the boy was sweating and sleeping, dreaming. Titania could tell of something unpleasant. I think it's time to talk about our goals for Brad, he said, and put a hand on the beastie over the boy's foot and wiggled the foot back and forth as he talked, asking them whether they were really doing the best thing for the boy, whether they should continue with a treatment that was not making him better. What else could we do? Titania asked him, not understanding what he was saying, but suddenly not wanting him in the room or on the bed or touching the boy. We could make him comfortable, he said. Isn't he comfortable? Titania asked. Isn't he sleeping? Not finally, Dr. Beetle said. We could be doing more and less. We could stop doing what isn't helping and not do anything that would prolong the suffering. Then Oberon, who had been eyeing the man warily from the couch, leaped up, shouting, smother her, smother doctor, get back to hell. I don't understand, Dr. Beetle said. I don't mean that at all, not at all. He looked at Titania with an odd combination of pleading and pity. Do you understand, he asked her. In reply, she drew herself up and shook off every drop of the disguising glamour and stood there entirely revealed to him. He seemed to shrink and fell off the bed, and while he was not kneeling purposely in front of her, he happened to end up on his knees. She leaned over him and spoke very slowly. You will do everything mortally possible to save him, she said. The night the boy died, there were a number of miraculous recoveries on the ward. They were nothing that Titania did on purpose. She did not care about the other pale, bald-headed children in their little red wagons and masks, did not care about the mothers whose grief and worry seemed to elevate their countenances to resemble Titania's own. Indifference was the key to her magic. She and her husband could do nothing for someone that they loved. So all the desperate hope she had directed at the boy was made manifest around her in rising blood counts and broken fevers and unlikely remissions. It made for a, fest for, it made for a different sort of day, with so much good news around, it seemed hardly anyone noticed that the boy had died. Oberon sat on the floor in a corner of the room, trying to quiet the broken-hearted wailing of the beastie, but not making a sound himself. Titania sat on the bed with the boy. A nurse had been in to strip him of his tubes and wires and had drawn a sheet up to just under his chin. His eyes were closed, and his face looked oddly less pale than it had in life and illness. The glamour was in tatters. Oberon was supposed to be maintaining it, and now Titania found that she didn't really care enough to take up the work. No nurse had been in for hours, and the last to come in had lain down upon the clover-covered floor and giggled obtrusively until some thoughtful fairy had put an egg in her mouth to shut her up. Before she had gone, before she had gone drunk, the nurse had mentioned something about funeral arrangements, and Titania was thinking of those now. We should take him home, she said aloud, and no one stirred. But she said it again every few minutes, and by twos and threes, the fairies crowding the room began to say it too. And then they started to build a beer for him, tearing out the cabinets and bending the IV pole and ripping the streets and the blankets. When they were done, the walls were stripped and the furniture was wrecked. Twelve fairies of more or less equal size bore the beer, and they waited while another dozen brownies hammered at the doorway to widen the exit. When they were ready, they all looked at Titania, who nodded her permission. Oberon was the last to leave, standing only when Doorknob tugged at his arm after the room had emptied. There was no disguise left to cover them. People saw them for what they were, 
A hundred and two fairies and a dead boy proceeding down the hall with harps and flutes, crowded in the service elevator with fiddles and lutes, marching out of the hospital with drums. Mortals gaped, dogs barked, cats danced on their hind feet, and birds followed them by the dozen, hopping along and cocking their heads from side to side. It was early afternoon. The fog was breaking against the side of the hill, and Buena Vista Park was brilliantly sunny. They passed the ordinary trees of the park and in, then into the extraordinary trees of their own realm and came to the door in the hill and passed through that as well. They marched into the great hall and put down the beer. The music played on for a while, then faltered little by little, and the players came to feel unsure of why they were playing. Then the hall was quiet because they didn't know what to do next. They had never celebrated or mourned a death before. They were all looking to Titania to speak, but it was Oberon who finally broke the silence, announcing from the back of the room that the beastie had died of its grief. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm happy to take questions if anyone can think of one or two or a few. Uh, yes. First of all, thank you. That was very moving. If I may, I'd like to ask some procedural questions of you about your writing process. I'm curious how you gather materials. Um, I'm especially interested in the way you structured this bit, uh, the jumps from the present to the memories. Um, and if you have a moment, I'd like to hear a bit about where this stands in relation to the rest of the book. Um, so maybe I'll try and go backwards um, with those. Uh, this uh, story is, um, it comes at the very beginning, actually. That, uh, that, so the novel is about three people who are on their, go try, take shortcuts through Buena Vista Park on their way to a party in a big fancy house on Buena Vista East um, and get lost and then get tangled up in some fairy uh, politics. Uh, um, uh, but the, um, uh, but the, uh, uh, the first section of the novel, um, this is sort of a flashback to explain why Titania is such a mess um, in the beginning of the, of, the, of the book, and then there's sort of a, a, little, a bit of a sequel to it in the last section. So this comes pretty early, actually. Um, and then, um, I took the risk in going backwards of forgetting what the other two questions were. But, I, uh, but um, uh, in terms of, um, uh, oh, uh, so there's not my, uh, so I'm, I'm a bit of a mess process wise. Um, I don't, uh, 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 I, I, um, at some point a long time ago I had big stretches of time where I could um, sit down and, uh, and, and try and get work done. But um, uh, as I uh, uh, get uh, older, um, even though I um, am, uh, still feel uh, like a, uh, a responsibility-free child compared to some of my friends who, um, uh, who have kids, um, uh, I've managed to entangle myself in enough other obligations that there always seems like there's something else to do. And sometimes it, uh, the, the stuff that's to be done feels a bit more important than writing, or writing can feel a little self-indulgent. Um, uh, uh, when I uh, uh, um, try to set time aside just for that. So it's mostly just here, here and there. Um, and often when I'm... Uh, uh, Previously, when I had lots of time to write, it seemed like I could never actually get any of it done. Uh, and there was some sort of uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, there was something sort of um, uh, self-indulgent also about the sort of uh, self-loathing that not getting the writing done um, when you had all day to write uh, would engender. Uh, but um, uh, but there, there seems to be some utility in having some other project to do and then sneaking away to go write. Uh, and I get more, uh, more done in, in an hour of forbidden writing time than I, I used to in, uh, in five of, uh, of, um, of not so forbidden time. Has the New Yorker distinction of 20 under 40 uh, complicated your life, shall we say? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, uh, it was uh, neat, 
um, to, um, to end up on that list. Lists like that are always a little goofy. Um, I think it would have complicated my life a lot more um, uh, um, uh, because of all that I would have spent some uh, spent enough time gnashing my teeth if I um, had been neglected. That, I, uh, <laughs> that um, uh, I'm sure I would have, would have gotten myself into some kinds of complicated trouble, uh, but um, uh, but not particularly. Um, uh, I think the the uh, the nicest thing about it has been that I think folks who might not otherwise have encountered my writing um, got interested enough just because of the because they decided um, uh, they were going to look into everybody on the um, on the list. Um, and I've heard from uh, a few folks who discovered stuff that they wouldn't uh, that, that took a look at stuff that they wouldn't ulti uh, uh, ultimately have. And but I think the sort of the neatest part of seeing them do that for me was to see a bunch of names on there of people who I uh, uh, sincerely uh, admired um, uh, and who I wished had more um, more readers than I could gather for them just by um, uh, uh, grabbing people at weddies, weddings and turning to them on the subway to say how good what I was reading um, was. Um, uh, but, um, uh, uh, but no, uh, no Dreadful complications. And you were 41, so you said. Yeah, I just. Uh, yeah, no, it was uh, actually they would have. Um, uh, they were very strict about that. If I had, uh, if I hadn't just, I just squeaked by by like six months. <laughs> but if I, uh, if the uh, uh, issue had come out closer to my birthday, I would have, I would have been gnashing my teeth. <laughs> Oh, um, I, uh, I think I had, it was, uh, it's kind of my favorite um, Shakespeare play, which I, I think is probably true for a lot of folks. And there was, uh, I used to, when I was a, a, a resident at UCSF, which was a while ago, uh, between 2001 and 2005, I, um, I lived in the Castro, and so I, when I walked, I would walk to work sometimes and I would cut through the park. And it made for kind of a mysterious journey at dawn or uh, coming home at night just as the sun was setting. There's some pretty spectacular views in there. And then also on foggy nights, it just started, it feels a little creepy. And not just because of the more mundane sorts of fairies who are uh, out and about. Um, uh, um, uh, so I, um, uh, I, had this, I had this sort of ongoing sense of the park as a, otherworldly place um, and didn't uh, necessarily know what to do with that or have any ideas about something to, to do with that until um, uh, uh, until um, um, uh, one day I, I looked up and saw it sort of surrounded by by fog and it um, it suddenly uh, 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 hit me that that something magical could could happen in there um, and that came together with uh, another was the idea I'd had for this story, um, which I knew was going to be about Titania and Oberon, um, uh, and um, uh, uh, and it all fell together in a way that that still seems a little mysterious. Any other questions? Okay. Right. Thanks again. Thank you all so much for coming, and thanks again, especially to Chris Adrian for being here. What a treat to hear from your new work. So that's a great night coming out in April? Uh, May. May, May. So everyone keep your eyes open for that. I know that I will be. And if you'd like to buy a book in the meantime, please, our ASUC book table is over here, and the author will be signing in the back corner. Thank you all, and I look forward to seeing you next month, March 10th, for Yi Yun Lee.